Motive. This is the second chapter, really the first key concept in the book after the introduction. And now we're going to move to the fourth chapter, which is uh, motivation, how to build motivation. And the uh, key uh, idea for that aspect is that um, motivation is constructed internally from one sense of identity and can never really be derived from an external source or an external point of reference. Uh, the first section in that chapter, what I'm explaining is that uh, it's called 75% of motivation is non-motivational. All right, so in the same way 75% of communication is non-verbal, most of what you communicate is with your body language, your tone of voice, the situation you're in. 75% of motivation is non-motivational. The vast majority of it has to do with the people you're around, the way you feel about yourself, and just your behavioral habits that you won't necessarily connect to motivation per se. So uh, motivation is a lot like uh, the chemistry in a relationship. The same way you can't force, encourage, or logically convince someone to be with you romantically, you can't really force, encourage, or logically convince yourself to stay motivated. Because the things you'll do will be just like surface level concerns. It won't be about who you are as a person. Like for you to build motivation, you really gotta start thinking about yourself at a deeper level, at a deeper plateau. Because usually what people do is they'll like read motivational quotes, right? They'll put stuff on their mirror. Maybe they'll read a New York best time, uh, New York, uh, what is it, New York Times bestseller, or they'll um, like watch an inspirational movie, which is good, we all need to start somewhere. But long-term motivation begins with rethinking and reconsidering certain aspects of life that we tend to leave on autopilot. Most people like wholeheartedly ignore. So for instance, if you think like, what is my purpose in life? That's like a good place to start because without a sense of purpose, you don't have a sense of order or direction. Like, you wouldn't get on the train unless you had somewhere to go. You wouldn't be motivated to do something unless you understood concretely what the end result would be. So in the same way, people who uh, tend to stay focused, manage their time well, and stay motivated, they have a, um, they have a, uh, a calling or a mission, mission that they can orient their behavior around. And that's what keeps them focused even when they don't feel like it or even when they meet setbacks. So. Um, there are two others, but I have an exercise for each. Of, it's like a triad. The first is discovering your purpose. The second is knowing your talents and strengths. And the third is knowing your unique personal code. All right, so I'll, uh, I'll go through the exercise for uh, purpose now. I should have, if I thought about it, I would have got some index cards, pens, and papers so cats could actually like write it out. Uh, but next time we'll have more tools, etc. Um, take a second and think about, this exercise is called What Ticks You Off? So if you take a second and think about like what gets you the most frustrated in the world, what is it that like gets your blood boiling? What are like some of your biggest pet peeves? And invert that into its opposite, you get a strong sense of what your purpose is. So it could be anything from something big like war or poverty, or even something like bad cooking or bad fashion. For me, ignorance is a real like pet peeve of mine. Like I don't like to be around ignorant people. So what's the exact positive opposite of that? You get what I'm saying? Something. You get what I mean? So if you, if you have trouble thinking about what your purpose or your mission is, just think about what gets you the most tight, and then like 180 degree that, and you'll have like at least a framework. Think at least three or five of them, and then you, you can make a sentence like, my purpose in life is to help people experience more blank, blank, and blank. So what ticks you off? Think about what ticks you off and flip that. Second, um, knowing your talents and strengths. Uh, the interesting thing about talents and strengths is that um, we tend to be so good at it that we don't think of it as anything important. Like if you're nice at something, it comes so naturally to you that you just assume everybody can do it. So one thing you can do here is you can talk to people who know you pretty well. Just hit them up and be like, you know, I'm thinking about uh, bringing my talents to the forefront more. I'm thinking about being more, more motivated by making sure that my life reflects what I'm actually good at. Because the thing is people try to, especially in the self-help field, we have this fixation on weakness. It's what I call the fixation on weakness. Think about self-help and self-development. People try to become average. They try they focus on what they're weak at and try to compensate for that, which is very, very difficult to do. If you think about what you're strong at and focus on that, you get 10 times the results that you would if you think about what you're bad at and try to run against that grain. And generally speaking, the more you focus on what you're good at, the more your weaknesses kind of like fall into the background. People won't even notice them. So um, a life that, that centers around talents and strengths is really like a life of power. 
It's a life of impact. It's a life of like, uh, what's the word? Like magnetism. So again, if you call someone up and ask them, if you talk to people who know you pretty well, they'll give you insight that you wouldn't even, it's stuff that you don't even notice more often than not. Uh, for example, like I, uh, when I was at Hampton, I dated this, I dated this girl. And she's like, Brian, you're really in touch with yourself. I'm like, who the hell else am I supposed to be in touch with? You know what I mean? It took me a while to realize, like, not a lot of people are like that. And the few who are, they don't necessarily have a venue or they don't have a platform to get into that, to explore that, like, concretely. So talk to someone who, um, who knows you well and have them tell you what you're good at. It's going to be stuff you wouldn't suspect. Also, if you think about what makes you zone, like when you're feeling really down, when you're feeling depressed, when you're not feeling good, what are some things you do that get you out of that, like, rut? That's like a good key, um, that's a good key indicator. There's a guy, Chikai, Chikai Miksen Mihai. He wrote a book called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience. So he calls it flow. What makes you flow, what makes you zone, what makes you space out. If you can identify like three or four um, skill sets or three or four activities, that's really good. And the more you can bring that, because you'll be feeding yourself basically. You'll be nourishing yourself with the activities that make you feel the most on point. So it's only natural that you'll feel more energized, you'll feel more optimal, you'll feel more motivated in general. All right, so that's unique talents and strengths, purpose. And the last, this is the most difficult. It's called, um, in the book I say, adhere to your sense of personal code. Because um, a life that centers around your own personal values, your own independent vision of what's important, is a life that centers around like advancement and strength, rather than hypocrisy and fraud. Because most of the people you see, they're just replicating what they see on TV. They're replicating what they think they need other people to approve them to be, is. And um, the more you identify like what's important to you, and the more you develop the courage to be about that and to exhibit that in your actual life, the more you feel like, you know, like you're untouchable. Not untouchable like you're better than anybody else, but untouchable in the sense like, the social world, the consumerism, the ignorance, it's not part of who you are. You're just here. But you really have your own kind of like sub-reality, your own uh, solar system, if you will. Um, to develop your, uh, or to discover your unique talents, not your unique talents, to discover your unique um, personal code, your unique values, your unique principles, I have an exercise that's called, what do they embody? This is pretty good. If you think about three people you admire, five people you admire, it could be a parent, it could be a family member, it could be a community member, it could be a fictional character from a comic book or a video game or from a novel, it could be a historical figure, it could be anybody. If you think about like the principles they embody, like maybe make a list of ten for each character, what you'll find is there's parallels between the three characters. It's pretty, it's, it's like obvious, but it's pretty deep at the same time. So like if you think about what do the people you admire embody? And think about what the similarities are between that set. You get a good indicator of what it is that, that's why it speaks to you. You know, it's nothing you might not necessarily consider, but that's essentially why it speaks to you. So think of what do they embody, and then try to find ways to um, develop and cultivate goals that represent that or that indicate that. And then you'll feed yourself at, a, at another level. All right, so that's half of the chapter, how to build motivation. Just remember, motivation is about identity, not encouragement or inspiration. It's good to get inspired. It's good to get encouraged. We all need that. But if, like, you have to diagnose motivation at a certain level because you want to make it like something as automatic as tying your sneakers. It's like you're motivated because of who you are, not because you read something or you saw something or whatever because that's, uh, that's dependent on the external environment, which could be positive or negative depending on, you know what I mean, what the situation is. So um, 